Hello and welcome to the eighth edition of our podcast series, Talking Data, which offers timely insights into macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading. I will be today's moderator. Our podcast features Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. In today's installment, Jim will provide his insight on the second wave of COVID. Jim, Europe is experiencing a second wave right now. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, you know, it's getting really interesting in what's happening in Europe. Um, they're up to, <coughs> excuse me, nearly 40,000 cases a day in Western Europe from about 15,000 cases a day six weeks ago. They are higher than they were in the number of cases per day than they were in April when, you know, everything was locking down and it was getting worse. So if the question is, when was the worst point in Europe's case count? The answer is right now. Now that I've said that, inevitably, every time I tweet this out or mention it, people always say, what about the death rate? What about the hospitalization rate, the ICU rate, the demographics of the people that are getting sick, the new treatments, <coughs> excuse me, on and on and on. All of those are valid arguments. And yes, this wave does seem to be one where it is more infectious, but less, le less lethal. But as I've been pushing back on, it's the case count that drives behavior and policy. Behavior and policy are not, people are not waiting to see how many people go to the hospital, how many people die. They're, when they see case counts are going up, vulnerable populations like the older populations or the comorbidity populations, they stop economic activity. That's a nice way of saying they stay at home. Um, politicians, like they did in the, U in the UK, they've restricted everything to no more than six people in a gathering at all in the country again. It's all about case count. So yes, you could tell me that it's not as lethal, and I agree with you, it's not as lethal. And I agree with you that maybe <laughs> the lockdowns might be ineffective. But I'm here to tell you that if the case count goes up in Europe, they're, they're getting lockdowns and their economy is going to retard. And you're seeing signs of that in Europe. And you're also seeing signs of it where it's really showing up is in their financial system. Their bank stocks are just getting killed right now. They're at 30 plus year lows back on their bank stocks as well too, because if the economy doesn't move forward, they're looking at a banking system that's going to have real problems, higher defaults, and so there is a natural reaction to it. So the European case count is moving up, and it's going to be a retardant on the European economy. Either people are going to self-isolate and pull back the economy, or governments will respond with a partial shutdown, and that's another way that's going to retard the economy too. Well, I know it might be on a lot of folks' minds is how is this impacting the U.S.? Like, will it spread to us? What can we expect here? That's a good question. What we do know here is that we peaked in late July at around 70,000 cases a day. We're down around 40,000 cases a day now. But in the last couple of weeks, the case counts have bottomed out in the U.S. and they've moved up a little bit. They've really moved up a lot in rural areas, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, uh, Wyoming, booming cases. Wisconsin booming cases. And you're also starting to see signs of it starting to move up, you know, a little bit in New York City as well, too. They just got over a 3% positive rate for the first time in several months. All told, the case counts are starting to creep higher in the US, but nothing material just yet. But when we look at what's happening in Europe, the fear is, is that just like it was in February and March, Europe led the US. The, you know, the comment I was making back then was, look at what's happening in Italy. They're just two to three weeks ahead of us. And the fear is that that might be this, this situation again, is what's happening in Europe now is telling us what's going to be happening in the second half of October in the United States, just in time for the election, right? Another, another spike in the case counts. And that might be the inspiration or at least a contributing factor the recent 10% correction in the stock market is that we're starting to see the percolation of a second wave. Again, probably more contagious, less lethal, but it's all about go to any 75 year old and say, hey, the case counts are spiking again, but don't worry, no one's dying of it. You wanna go out to dinner tonight? Absolutely not. They're going to react accordingly. 
they're going to stop moving. They're going to stop with their economic activity. So it really is case count that drives the policy for a lot of this. That moves us into the next um, section. If we look at the second wave, you touched on a little bit with Europe. How does it, what is the impact on the financial markets and the economy? If we could dive a little bit deeper. Yeah, <clears throat> the big thing about what's happened with the financial markets is I do think that there's been a disconnect between them and the real economy. The Fed backstop has encouraged a lot of speculation and a lot of confidence to own financial assets. The, even the, and I don't want to put the Fed in there. I want to put the federal government in there too. When the government is bailing out the airline industry and the restaurant industry and giving money to the cruise lines and stuff, they're, they're sending a message on stocks. They'll either go up or we'll throw money at them to make sure they go up. So you've got a lot of speculation. And because of that, I think because of it, you've got the highest levels of valuation in the stock market since the bubble peaks of 20 years ago, 2000. Forward PE ratios, what Wall Street thinks earnings are going to be in the next year, divided by the current price, the 25, 26 is the highest it's been. Market cap to GDP is just below the 2000 peak. A lot of other metrics of valuation are right there at the 2000 highs. Market, by most measures, is probably overvalued. Now, the hope is, oh, okay, it's, it's a little bit ahead of itself, but the economy will eventually speed up and justify these levels. That's the hope. But not if we get a second wave. If we get a second wave, even if it's not lethal, it'll retard growth enough that you will not meet those valuation levels. And that's why I think it helped to stumble the uh, U.S. stock market. Bond market, let me take a little different tact on the bond market. Our last podcast, I talked about when will the bond market wake up. One of the comments I made in there was the current level of the bond market, which is the same level every day, which is it doesn't go anywhere. It's always 66 basis points on the 10-year note. And as we're talking right now, the big story is we're at 65 basis points in the 10-year note. As long as it doesn't go anywhere, either up in yield or down in yield, that's probably the best outcome for risk markets. If it goes up in yield a lot, that would imply losses in the bond market or maybe a return of inflation, that would be bad. If it goes down in yield a lot, that would imply a serious retraction in the economy again, that would be bad. So as long as we continue meandering sideways in bonds, that's the best scenario. If we get a second wave, the second wave does threaten to put volatility into the bond market, move it off these levels, probably lower because the fear would be at that point that we'd be looking at a slowing of the economy. Again, I think the 33 basis point March 9th low was the end of the bull market that started in 1981. So we can move lower, but I don't think we're going to come close to testing that if we get a second wave. But more importantly, if bonds move, from this sideways action up or down, I think it does portend a negative scenario for risk markets. They've been sideways since April. Since April, they've been sideways, just meandering about. So the bond market has been kind of a non-player in this, but it may become one. And when we're looking at a second wave, how's this going to impact interest rates? Yeah, I, I think that as far as the Fed goes, they're not going to raise rates anytime soon. They've promised us that they're not going to raise rates. I put the caveat, my personal caveat in that is, I believe that they have no interest in raising rates unless inflation returns to the point that the uh, market fears inflation and demands of the Fed to raise rates. On the downside, if we do get a second wave, they're certainly not going to cut rates. Uh, they do have the tool of their uh, choice is quantitative easing and they've got their emergency lending programs in place and they've got a lot of excess capacity, they can buy securities. That's one of the reasons why I've argued in some of these previous podcasts, look, you've got speculation and galore in the, in the stock market, you got overvaluation, why aren't you outrageously bearish? Because you got the Fed out there willing to print money, the vernacular, I know they're not technically printing money, but the vernacular of printing money to support the markets, you've got the federal government willing to bail out troubled industries, and that should provide in needed support. So I don't think the Fed's going to raise rates unless the market wants rates raised. And you'll know that because you'll first see long-term interest rates go up a lot and cause problems and demand the Fed 
And I don't think they're going to cut rates below zero. I don't think we're going to take out 33 basis points as the low. I think what they'll do is they'll do more QE and maybe more of their emergency lending programs. So will a medical bail bailout save us? It would, it could. A medical bailout, meaning a vaccine, could put an end to all of this. Here's a vaccine, everybody take a shot. Good, the thing's gone away. Please resume as you did pre-pandemic. Now, the problem with this is, when is this gonna happen? So I'll point out that there is a research project online called goodjudgment.io, which is run by the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School. And what it is, is that they have a prediction market, a betting market, but it's a closed betting market. It's a betting market of several dozen experts in certain fields. So it's not just anybody, but it's people that are informed about these subjects that are placing wagers on when they think things are gonna happen. One of the betting markets that they have, they got, the, they got a couple dozen of them out there on various topics. One of the betting markets that they have is when will we have a widely available vaccine? And the leading choice is not until July 1st of next year. Number two choice is March to July of next year. So I'll just take that as my, my benchmark. Yeah, if we get a vaccine, a widely available vaccine, and assuming that it isn't tarnished by safety concerns and people want to take it, um, we could we can end all this. But that if you take these experts and they seem to be consistent with other things that I've read, we could still be six to nine months away from it. Not six to nine weeks, or as Trump would like to think, six to nine days, uh, but six to nine months away. So this medical bailout, yeah, they would be great if we get it. It would be great if it happened sooner than we think, <clears throat> but it might not be until spring or summer of next year, which means that we're going to have to go through a whole nother second wave here. And now all of the reactions and emotional responses and government policy changes that would come with it. That gives us quite a bit of time um, before that will actually happen. Any yeah. um, thoughts as we begin to summarize um, for today? No, the only thing I'll throw out is that um, this week's podcast, um, I wanted to talk about COVID and the risks that it poses here today. The second risk, which I'm going to save for the podcast later this week, is going to be about the election and the debate. Um, we're recording this on Tuesday, uh, the 29th, a few hours before the about four hours before the debate. Um, I'll report after the debate because that's the other big risk I think that we're going to have to look at in addition to the COVID second wave. But let's see how that debate plays out, and we'll talk about that one in our next uh, podcast. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim, for your thoughts today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm that produces innovative research across a broad range of global fixed income, equity, currency, and commodity markets. Bianca Research and Arbor Data Science are our two most prominent research offerings. Jim will be hosting a conference call this Thursday, October 1st at 9 a.m. Central Time, titled, Is the Election About to Take Center Stage? Please join us for registration information. Please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com.